Phạm Thị Cúc Hà I like to think uh, that I'm an educator and entrepreneur Graduated from Flinders University I have been using my learned knowledge, skills and experience to set up our own schools using Australian education models. Today I'm going to tell you about Australian education system and how they help students to become not only better learners but also better people, the best virgins of themselves. Welcome to the IFO Nightly Show. I'm your host, Tung Dang, and today it's all about global citizenship. We've just watched a snippet about today's guest, and I'm excited to meet and chat with her, who is not only an educator, but an expert in education in every sense of the word. Please welcome Ms. Phuc Han. Hello. Hi there. <laughs> Uh, you got the entrance right. <laughs> Very nice Hi, to meet you. Nice to meet you. Please be seated. Thank you. All right. What do you think about our set? Uh, it's exciting. Uh, a little bit scary for me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because of all the cameras and the lights. <laughs> yes. So professionally, I think you would be characterized as an educator, but for the viewers at home, just to get to know you a little bit better. So uh, what three adjectives would you use to describe your work in the field of education? Okay, um, so after about 20 years working in education, I would say uh, the first word would be um, exciting. Exciting. Uh, yeah, I get uh, very excited every day going to work. Um, there's uh, always something new um, to be excited about mm -hmm. uh, my work every day. The second word would be um, challenging. For sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's never been easy. Um, it's never been, it's very difficult and challenging from the uh, beginning. Uh, it's never been um, easy throughout the whole process uh, to meet all the expectations of the parents, of the teachers, uh, of the students as well. The third word, I would say um, rewarding. Mm -hmm. So, you can see that it's very contradicting, but uh, working in education is um, very rewarding. Um, it's very rewarding to see um, an improvement from a student. It's very rewarding to receive uh, a simple thank you note mm -hmm. from parent. You've had quite a decorated uh, academic uh, journey. So you got your degree in pedagogy in Russia, and then you went on to study a master's degree in Australia, and now you're managing a few schools um, that uh, abide by the Australian model of education. So uh, could I maybe ask you, what is your fascination with Australian education? Why do you like it so much? Yep, for me, it's maybe it started with my personal experience. So maybe because I had really uh, positive experience studying in Australia. So I studied my master degree at uh, Flinders University in mm -hmm. South Australia. Uh, my daughter at the time was with me too. And she also had amazing time there, mm -hmm. um, transforming her actually from a very shy girl into a very confident, still soft-spoken. So what I like about Australian curriculum frameworks um, is the, a set of capabilities. Mm. That's a set of capabilities that I think it's just right. Mm. It's right for students of the 21st century. It's right for um, students globally, but it's actually especially right uh, for Vietnamese students mm. um, culturally, and that's something they need. Mm. So um, the capabilities are, so first, uh, numeracy. So mm. you know, no, like math literacy skills, yeah. literacy, uh, the language, mm -hmm. um, information and communication technology. So you can see three essential capabilities that are um, to be implemented throughout, from the foundation years up to high schools. Mm -hmm. um, other capabilities are creative and critical thinking. Mm -hmm ethical understanding, mm. um, intercultural um, understanding, 
and um, social and personal capability. Mm. So if you look through those um, set, set of capabilities, you can see that it's knowledge, it's skills, um, it's also what make a person um, to be a good person, a good citizen, yeah. to be ethical, yeah. to be um, interculturally understanding, mm -hmm. to accept and understand other cultures. Mm -hmm. It's great that you touched on the point of global citizenship because this is what uh, this episode is all about. So uh, could you tell me your maybe exhaustive definition of what it means to be globally ready? What, what, what does it mean, global readiness? When people actually um, could be on the same page regarding knowledge um, or skills um, and also to understand each other. Mm. So I think uh, to be global read, uh, globally ready, you need only uh, not only skills and knowledge, but you also have to be equipped so south with uh, cultural understanding. So in order to be a global citizen, you need to um, be able to know the language, to communicate, to know how to communicate, and so to speak, to uh, speak the same language mm -hmm. with uh, different people around the world. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, like uh, being proficient in whatever it is that's the you know, global lingua franca, you know, and, you know, in today's context, it probably is English, right? Uh, it's key to becoming uh, a, a globally ready person. Is there any, uh, are there any other qualities that you think are necessary to global readiness? I want to emphasize on communication mm -hmm. as well. In order to, to be an um, effective uh, communicator, you need to know the language, but you also need to know how to communicate. So the how to communicate would, would include not only that you know the language well, but you also understand the culture. Yeah. And so to um, communicate effectively. Yeah, otherwise you would just seem very out of touch. Exactly. And even if you're really proficient in the language, you will not make your point uh, heard or you will not, nothing will come across. Yeah. So obviously you talked at length about the advanced um, Australian education system, especially for people in their formative years. But let's uh, elaborate more on um, you know, the high school years where there's a lot of personal transformation going on. So how do Australian high schools uh, prepare young individuals for global citizenship? How do they make the students more globally ready? I think for senior secondary education, the focus is more on personalization mm -hmm. or on study personal learning plan mm -hmm. for each student. Mm. Each student capabilities, interests, the career paths they have in mind. So a very strong focus on individuality and very tailored to each uh, different individual. So that's why um, there will be some compulsory subjects um, for all states, the composite subject would be English. Some states would make math compulsory. But apart from that, students would be able to choose whatever subjects they want to do. Just their own pathway. Yes. So we um, Vietnamese students studying in Australia, for example, um, are very successful. I think um, they are successful because they can choose subjects that matter to them. Um, and so um, they uh, have really high ATA scores uh, in Australia. So we have a student named Hien Ang um, who studied in Australia uh, from year 11 mm -hmm. at Hobart Co College in Tasmania. Mm -hmm. And last year she has ATA score of 98.75%. Oh, so that would put her among the 1.25%. So yeah, 1.25% of top students graduating that year in Tasmania. Um, so thank you for the very enlightening education on Australian education, particularly high school education.
I've just finished touching up my room so that the background looks decent when I'm on the app. Oh, and I'm Tit here. Welcome back to another episode of iPhone Season 7. I hope you are doing well during this very tough time. Uh, due to the pandemic and the restriction this entire season, and um, I just can't wait to chit chat with my special guest over Zoom for the first time ever. I bet she's here now, so without further ado, let's meet her. Hi, Hui, how are you doing? You look snatched. <laughs> Thanks. You look good too. How are you? I I'm good. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name is Clay. I'm 19 years old and I recently just got back from Melbourne because of coronavirus. Well, not recently, but a year ago. So, so where do you study now? Uh, I'm studying art in RMIT. Well, design studies in RMIT. Oh, so we go to the same uni. Nice. Oh, don't mind me. I'm just acting dramatic because I already knew it beforehand. <laughs> uh, in case you miss it, every guest coming to IFL has to complete a challenge. And of course, the challenge is all about staying healthy and maintaining good physique during the lockdown. Are you up for it? Yeah, I'll I try my best. Oh. So now we have to do the plank posture for 30 seconds to the music that the Eiffel crew has chosen for us. Okay. So before we start, I have a question for you. This is the question for every guest of IFL this season because this season it's gonna be all about Australia. So the question is, if you had to pick one place or one unique thing about Australia, what would it be? Um, it's gonna sound really boring, but I guess the people, the people is so really nice um, from elders, elders to like children, they're all really nice. And also, personally, the thing I like the most about Melbourne is um, the city, the CBD, like the central. It's just so crowded there and um, it got everything, like the food, like the shopping, everything. And also, I really like um, going on trains because I live in the suburb, so I got to travel to the CBD by train. I just love sitting on trains. <laughs> I can sit on there like on, for hours. So yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I can vouch for that because I have been to Melbourne as well. Uh, now let's go into the talk about firstly your high school years. So I can see a lot of oh I can see a really nice painting behind you. Is yeah. that your drawing? Um, sadly, it's not. This is my dad's drawings. Most Ooh. of my works are um, still stuck over at Austria, at Melbourne at my old home state. So. Where did your pension for art emanate from and uh, who and what are your biggest inspiration? So ever since I was young, I have always been surrounded by art. Um, my dad is an artist, my other relatives is also artists. Like, they do different stuff, like they do music, they do poetry. Um, so I guess it just comes naturally to me to love art. I can see why you ch chose to major in art in university right now. You must be in your element. Uh, so, to the best of my knowledge, back in high school, you did not go to a traditional high school, but you enrolled in kind of a vocational school in Australia. Uh, what was it like for you, and how did you come to such decision? Oh, it was really nice. I was so sad that I have to leave um, um, my school early. I'm really bad at math physics and chemistry, basically all things that have to do with numbers. And also, I don't really have that much friends. I only got like two friends at school. <laughs> I always knew that I would go study abroad and my family also knew that. We just don't know when and um, which school are we going to go to. Um, we actually have several options, but then this one pops up at the last minute and um, 
this course really special because I don't have to study any of um, like physics or like literature or anything. I only have to study art and it's a really good fit. So um, yeah, like there wasn't, there wasn't any second question, like second guesses about the school. Oh, that sounds like my dream school because math and physics and chemistry were a nightmare for me back in high school. <laughs> Did you have any difficulty in pursuing your parents to let you go uh, abroad and studying in that school? Because uh, from my point of view, Vietnamese parents are kind of not familiar to the term of vocational school. Like they really place university at the topmost position. Yeah, um, I was very lucky because my parents um, don't Thing, does it think that university is the only way for you to be succeeded? And but also this was just high school, like a vocational high school. It's not like I'm gonna finish it and then I won't go to uni. Like it was um uni was like an open option for me. Um they don't force me to do anything, but rather just like nudge me along the right path like of what I wanted to do and what they think best benefit me in the future. So we don't, I don't have, actually have to um, persuade them much. So that was really lucky of me. <laughs> uh, but uh, do you have any vision of what you want to be doing in the future? <laughs> yes, actually, um, I want to be an art director. Well, more specifically, I want to be an art curator. Yeah, uh, it's a dream of mine. And it's going to be really hard because it's not a very common job in Vietnam. But also, um, it's really exciting to branch out into a new, like something new. Instead of just become like a normal artist. Because uh, I just think that art curator is a really, really um, interesting job that can help um, evaluate the art market. And that's what I want to do. Is an art curator's job is to uh, curate the arts of the artists and decide which one to put into the museum or exhibition, right? Yep, exactly. That sounds very cool and you sure will nail it. Oh, but there is one thing I'm still curious to hear. It's the syllabus and the curricula, extracurricular activities or the environment in general of the vocational school that you went to in Australia. What was it like? Oh, it was really fun because um, so we have, I guess, we can call it three divisions. We have art, we have music, and then we have engineering. It's really nice. And then when we get to year 11, we get to choose six subjects that we're going to do, and we would be focusing on that. And then six subjects, we study that from year 11 to year 12, and then um, we have our like university exam, basically. And then in between the six subjects, um, there is this one called, course called VET, which is basically, um, if I'm not wrong, it's basically a program to hide, to like develop skills in like a particular area that you want to develop. And then you get a certificate for that. And I, I believe VET have, like they have VET in all schools. Like if you want to do it, then you ask, your school and then they will enroll you to into one yeah. that sounds like a paradise for any art lovers i'm so happy that you seem to be really enjoying your life and have a clear vision in mind of what you want to do in the future but i bet your journey has never been a bed of roses and uh, you sure have a lot of s stories to tell about the difficulties and challenges that you encountered in the past, right? Yeah. But let's save it for the latter part of the talk. Right now, let's switch back to the studio where Mr. Tung Deng and now expert Kupa are also having another very informative convo. Welcome back to the IFO Nightly Show. As you can see, Hue is not exactly strong at academics, but she has a special talent, so she chose to pursue vocational education in Australia. And uh, Ms. Ha, for uh, the people at home, could you maybe elaborate on the concept of uh, vocational education in Australia and the type of uh, programs available for them? In um, 
high school level, they could already study some subjects that could lead them to vocational training, um, to uh, VET sector. So what is uh, VET short for VET? So VET is uh, vocational education and training. Mm, yeah. Excellent. So um, actually a very high percentage of students in Australia chose to do VET instead of universities mm -hmm. because they could um, get out and, and, and work earlier. So with vocational training, students can then go to work, but it doesn't mean that they cannot go into further study mm -hmm. uh, with certificates level, with diploma levels. Of course, when they have resources and time, they could study for universities part-time. Mm. Just as like extra insurance, ex an extra safety net. We are connected to uh, Mr. Derek Scott, uh, one of our experts in Australia here today on studio. So, hello Derek, what's going on down there? Hi Derek, nice to meet you. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, hello to Tung and Ha in the studio and uh, I'm really excited to be talking to uh, people in Vietnam today. So hi Derek, uh, we're going to pick your brain today and the first question I have for you is obviously a lot of people can choose to study um, a, a trade, a craft when they're in high school age. So could you maybe walk us through the kind of high schools available in Australia and what are the target audiences for each type of school? Yes, Australia has a, a, a very strong school system and a strong uh, system for supporting international students who come to this country. Uh, there are around 20,000 international students studying in schools in Australia each year and they're very well looked after and, uh, and get a great experience. Um, there are three types of schools in Australia. There are government schools uh, and then there are independent schools and then there are Catholic schools and all three deliver excellent outcomes for their students and are very strongly regulated by, by the, uh, the government, both the federal government and our state governments. Uh, the largest system is the government school system and uh, government schools will consist of many small government primary schools of perhaps around six to eight hundred students who do a great job and then larger secondary schools of somewhere between uh, eight hundred and two and a half thousand students uh, and each of those schools will then uh, deliver their own state or territory certificate of education uh, as the students go through to year 12. Uh, the Catholic schools are similar with many small primary schools and then some larger secondary schools and some schools that go all the way through from primary to secondary. And most of the independent schools uh, make up uh, a large part of the sector, around 11% of the total sector in Australia. The school sector is strongly regulated. Uh, the government has a lot of uh, safety and compliance components which make sure that it's safe for all students. It's very high quality very highly regarded around the world and the outcomes for students are very very strong. That's fascinating Derek. Obviously for international students um, they won't have the kind of support system that they enjoy here in Vietnam with their family around so uh, could you maybe introduce to the viewers uh, the kind of support available to international students when they go to um, a place as far away as Australia? Australian schools are a very safe place to study for international students. Um, there's a lot of uh, regulation and compliance around the schools uh, that the government's put in to ensure that safety. For example, uh, in my school in Victoria, every teacher uh, has to have a four-year university teaching degree. They have to be registered with the Institute of Teaching and they must have every five years a police check to make sure that every element of, of their capacity to teach and their, their, their character and, and their ability to look after the students is thought of. There's also regulations around schools accepting international students and every school uh, that takes international students will have a specific dedicated person who will look after the welfare and the well-being of those students to make sure that they are part of an inclusive environment, that they fit into the school and that their health and and their welfare is looked after and that, that communications with parents um, back home in Vietnam uh, are, are carried out regularly and the parents are kept informed of the progress of your daughters or your sons. 
Thank you, Derek, for the insight. Now, Ms. Ha and I were talking at length about uh, the different qualifications as well as the certificates that are unique to each region and each state in Australia. And could you maybe share with us how these certificates uh, gear students towards global readiness? Yes, if you choose to come to Australia to study for uh, a Year 12 certificate, uh, you will be doing the certificate of uh, the state or territory that you go to school in, in most cases. And each of them is different, but they all feed through into the Australian Tertiary Admissions Ranking, the ATAR. And that ATAR then is the, is the national scale that ranks students and gives them uh, the choices and opportunities as to which uh, universities or what further study they will go on to. The great thing about doing any of the Australian certificates and getting the ATAR is that it opens up uh, the world for you. It's accepted, the certificates are accepted in all the different countries of the world and we have many students each year, both local students and international students, uh, who complete their Victorian Certificate of Education and go on to great global universities, universities in America or in uh, the United Kingdom, as well as of course the universities in Australia. Another great thing about the certificates in Australia uh, is that there's a lot of choice. Uh, in nearly all of those certificates you have a lot of choice around the subjects that you choose and you can, if you have, enjoy studying a wide range of subjects you can do that or if you're a real math science specialist for example you can focus on those as well. So there's a lot of choice for students when they come out to Australia to study. Thank you Derek Scott for the insight. Uh, it's been lovely chatting to you and getting to know more about uh, Australian education. Now we're going back to Minghui and hear her story of how she chose to study vocational training in Australia. Let's take a break with IFO facts. Australia is the third most popular international student destination in the world. We might be a small country of 25.6 million people, but we're world leaders in education. Australia is one of the world's highest rated countries when it comes to student satisfaction. More than 89% of international students have said that they were satisfied, or very satisfied, with their Australian study experience, and now be excited for the next part of the show. Welcome back to the second part of I've Stay at Home. How did the experiences in Australia change you? and shape you into who you are today? Uh, it's gonna sound really textbook like, and really boring, but um, I was more independent. And I wasn't, and I started to embrace like my actual self. Like I wasn't afraid of anything anymore, really. Like um, before I, I used to be really shy and I wouldn't speak up. I wouldn't like voice out my opinion, even if I disagree with it or if something makes me feel uncomfortable I would just still go along with it um, but studying abroad like I have to do everything on my own and I realized if I don't you know stand up for myself like I can't I, I won't get nowhere so I so um, I started to be more vocal about my feelings my opinions and I don't let anybody overstep my boundaries yeah being vocal about your feelings that's what I really like about uh, what you share because I, th I think that's one of the most important things that we have to learn in today's world. Do you have any piece of advice that you want to give to the young people who also want to pursue a career in the field of creativity like you? I, I really, really don't think that I'm in a place where I can give advice to people. <laughs> because I still have a lot to learn and I still struggle with like a lot of things um, like in art in general but there is this um, saying that my dad once said that helps me a lot is that each person is a different individual and art is personal so don't let anyone make you feel bad about your style or your um, what are your skills like, it takes time, but don't let anything happen that will take the uniqueness of yours away, if that makes any sense. 
So that's pretty much of it for today. Thank you so much for the candid and informative sharing. I really hope that to some extent this conversation between us has provided some useful information and uh, insight into the uh, education in Australia and also the field of creativity. But uh, before we say goodbye, I heard that the Afro crew has prepared some challenge for us. So as you mentioned, you want to become an art director in the future. So this yeah. challenge is specially made out for you. Uh, it's oh. called stay at home photo shoot, right? It's, oh. it's called a homemade photo shoot and where you will be an art director and you will instruct me on how to take good photos. Okay. All right. Okay. This sounds scary. I'll try my best. <laughs>
Welcome back to IFO Nightly Show. What an inspiring story. Miss Ha, what do you think about uh, the journey of uh, Minh Khuê? I think it's uh, fascinating. Khuê has found um, an education system that helped her to uh, flourish, yeah. helped her to actually find herself, yeah. that you don't need to be um, the best, you don't need to be the most successful, you just need to be the best version of yourself. Mm, that's beautiful. So obviously you have extensive experience studying in Australia and it's a very multicultural environment. I would like to ask how it uh, benefited you personally and how it can benefit students in general. Um, yes, uh, we talked earlier about uh, global readiness, right? So I think uh, multicultural understanding or acceptance, um, it's something that is very um, important. Um, to be, to, to, in order to be a global citizen. And I think, like I mentioned earlier, one of the capabilities in Australian education system is uh, intercultural um, understanding. I think because Australia itself is a multicultural country, multicultural awareness um, or multicultural understanding and acceptance is something I've learned in Australia. When I did the training to implement the SACE in Vietnam, we went through um, all the assessment or exams papers to see if there's some culturally sensitive or gender sensitive issues in the exam paper because they wouldn't allow anything that would offend people of different cultures mm. in even exam papers. Mm. So I think there's a big things in, in, in Australia. And that's why I think Australia is home for um, lots of international students. And as you can see from Ming Kui's story, the multicultural environment in Australian schools has a transformative power. And it's been lovely to hear uh, Ming Kui's story as well as hear more from our expert Gung Ha here today. And uh, coming up next is the Voice of the Week Challenge. So don't go anywhere. Keep it locked. You're watching the IFO Nightly Show, and this is the Voice of the Week Challenge, a permanent fixture of the show since the very first season. We're currently filming under severe COVID-19 restrictions and uh, there's social distancing in uh, a couple of cities across Vietnam right now. But that doesn't stop us from connecting to our Voice of the Week candidate this week. It's very nice to meet you today, Tao, um, albeit under uh, less than ideal circumstances, but that's okay. Um, today we have an expert on the show and the topic is global citizenship. So are you ready for the topic of this week's Voice of the Week Challenge. Okay, the topic for you today is um, the earlier you engage in an international context, the more likely you would become global citizen. Do you agree with this statement? The pinnacle of technology facilitates us a lot in connecting with each other. The world is becoming a global village with us, the citizens. Hi everyone, I'm Phung Tao, a 20-year-old youngster who can't wait to take on the world. Eager to contribute to world's movement, a question popped up in my head. What is the fastest way to be a contributable part of the community, making our planet a better place? Is it true that the earlier I engage in an international context, the more likely I become a global citizen? For me, the answer is yes. To begin with, what exactly is global citizen? According to Oxfam, it is one's identity transcends geography or political borders, actively dedicate to community and work with others to make our planet more peaceful, sustainable, and fairer. Three things we can do to become a global citizen. One, build our own understanding of world events. Two, recognize our value. And three, let our voice be heard and have power to act and influence the world around us. 
Without any doubt, it takes time to become a global citizen. Global citizenship is not an additional subject. It's a framework for learning, reaching beyond school to the wider community. It must be set up at an early stage of one's life. The sooner we engage in an international context, the sooner we build our own understanding of world events. As the global interdependence is growing, world issues, for example, global warming or sexism, ask for the humanity engagement. Participating in the mission at an early stage creates more opportunities for youngsters to dedicate their ideas for the common achievement of mankind. As a global citizen, on the one hand, we embrace diversity of identities and culture. On the other hand, we contribute to the village diversity our own distinct character. Spoken from our own voice, it is our identity. Our culture stands us out from the crowd. So, however soon we get internationally involved, we must hold on to our roots, our motherland culture, and aware of our local communities. Our shores, my past, my roots, my homeland, proud of it as a part of me. I'm Phương Thảo, a global citizen soon to be. Thank you for your hearing. Thank you, Phương Thảo, for the presentation. Now you will get a chance to hear some feedback from our expert today. I think uh, first, um, her English, like the, your English is uh, very fluent. Um, you speak uh, like a native speaker. Um, second, um, the flow of your talk. Um, I think you have carefully planned uh, your talk. Um, the third point would be I really like the way you think um, about the topic. So you talk about being engaged in the international context but remain your identity. Um, so in a way, we want to be a global citizen, but we want to also remain our identity, our own culture, to be proud of our own culture and background. Thank you, Ms. Ha, for the very detailed and heartfelt review of Tao's performance. And Tao, uh, congratulations. I'd say those are rave reviews. And I'd say also that you would have a very decent shot at winning this year's Voice of the Year um, at the end of this season. So uh, that's when you will get a chance to win just a bunch of amazing prizes, uh, including uh, a trip to Australia when, uh, of course, when travel resumes. Thank you, Tao. I hope to chat to you again soon at Voice of the Year. Thank you, Tao, for a very impressive talk and uh, good luck. And that's it for this week's IFO Nightly Show. I personally have had a blast chatting with Miss Ha over here. How do you feel about your first time being on the show? Oh, I have enjoyed it. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. Um, and yeah, thank you for very interesting questions. I hope okay. you enjoyed that too. Of course. I mean, it was personally very enlightening for me to learn about all the different uh, choices and all the different forms of Australian education and the various pathways that a person who aspires to study in Australia can take and it's all very diverse and uh, we learned about uh, the multicultural environment of Australia and how that benefits um, a person in uh, you know just all levels of education you know um, so that's it for this week's IFO nightly show uh, I hope you guys have had fun and I'll see you guys in the next show for now goodbye This is a picture I took when I was on um, like holiday in Hanoi. Um, I took that and then later on in the school year, I used this picture as a reference to an artwork that I was doing. This is in our visual communication design class. We had to um, design like typography and like a, then put it on like objects like stamps or like books or something. And this oh. is an, an animation. We got to study animation.